Our, our speaker today is, is uh, Derek Musgrove and he teaches history at um, UMBC. Uh, he, he went there as an undergraduate and then went to uh, New York University for a master's degree and a PhD. Uh, he returned uh, to UMBC in 2012 and as of last week he just became uh, an associate professor of history at UMBC. Uh, his first book is a book called Rumor, Repression, and Racial Politics, published by the University of Georgia. And I just got my Journal of Southern History uh, today, and lo and behold, there's a review of Dr. Musgrove's book, and uh, it really is a terrific uh, review, and, and his mother should be proud of the review that he got uh, this book. Uh, I last... I first heard uh, and last heard um, uh, Derek Musgrove speak at the American Historical Association annual meeting in uh, January, and I really did hear him. Um, and um, uh, he gave a terrific talk on the relationship between the so called new Black Panthers and the so called old Black Panthers. Uh, the group I know are simply the Black Panthers or the Black Panther Party of the 1960s and 1970s, uh, but there's also a young uh, group uh, that's uh, uh, surged into the, uh, at least into the Fox News horizon in the, in the last uh, uh, four or five years. And he's going to talk about both groups today, so I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Dr. Uh, Derek Musgrove. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, come on, you guys are Gilman. You can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice, thank you. Um, let me begin by thanking Jerry Thornberry uh, uh, for inviting me out. And I, I think he just called me a big mouth uh, from uh, my um, AHA presentation. I was, I was shouting, as I usually do. Um, but I'm glad that he could hear everything, and I'm glad that he liked it uh, and invited me out here. Um, and thank him also for uh, showing me that book review. I had not seen it until just this morning, uh, and so it was really nice to read it and to know that folks are, are still talking nicely about the book as opposed to trashing it. Um, I want to begin this morning uh, with um, a story that led me to this project. And so I'm going to begin with the story, and then I'm going to ask you all a couple of questions. Uh, and I know that I am standing between you all and lunch. Is that correct? Okay, so I will be brief, uh, and we will make sure that we get this, end this right on time. So let me begin with a story. Uh, in 2002, over 300 graying members of the Black Panther Party, the original Black Panther Party, gathered on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia for the party's 31st, 35th pardon me, anniversary reunion. Many took the occasion to reunite with old comrades. A lot of them hadn't seen each other since they stopped becoming active in about the mid-1970s. And so they just got together, they traded old pictures, uh, they reunited with folks that they hadn't seen, and they kind of reminisced about their days when they tried to overthrow Babylon, as they called the United States government. Uh, but others were focused on less enjoyable endeavors, defending their legacy. The Panthers had, of course, always had to defend their legacy from a hostile white press, uh, a hostile government, particularly the FBI. Uh, they tried to label them as anti-white, violent, and criminal. But in the mid-1990s, some of them saw a new foe that was trying to threaten their legacy. And that was a group called the New Black Panther Party, uh, which used the party's name and its imagery, uh, but was pursuing goals, many of them thought, at odds with the party's goals, its ideology, uh, and its 10-point program. Now, imitation is the highest form of flattery, but as many of the old Panthers argued, this was not imitation. And they were going to make it clear at a panel called The Legacy of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and the New Black Panther Party. And that's a specific panel uh, that they put together for the occasion. The p panel began with Ron Scott reading from this letter. Ron Scott was the founder of, co-founder, pardon me, of the Detroit branch of the Black Panther Party. Uh, and he wrote, the, he read from this letter, it's hard to see, but this is a screenshot uh, from the Huey P. Newton Foundation, uh, which uh, dubs itself as the guardian of the true history of the Black Panther Party. And they put out a letter that was called, There Is No New Black Panther Party. Uh, and so you can see that I'm using that for the title of my paper uh, today. And in the, reading the letter, Scott said the following. 
The foundation denounces the usurpation of the Black Panther Party name by this questionable band of appointed leaders who promote concepts absolutely counter to the revolutionary principles on which the party was founded. Scott went on to ask, and he's sort of poking them in the eye with these questions, who are these people laying claim to the party's history and name? Are they reactionary provocateurs, entertainers, a group of anti-Semites? What is their agenda? And these are pretty strong uh, uh, accusations in this segment of the black left. Uh, and the reason that Scott phrased the letter in this way, and the reason that the uh, Huey P. Newton Foundation phrased the letter in this way, is because of this. Uh, this is the New Black Panther Party website. It, this is long gone. This was taken down in 2002. Uh, but you can see it has a picture right there in the middle next to their new 10-point platform, which is a little bit different than the original Panthers 10-point platform. And in that picture is Huey P. Newton on the right-hand side, who is one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. And next to him, holding an AK-47, is Khalid Muhammad, uh, who, was, at the who had, uh, was the chairman of the new Black Panther Party. They had superimposed his image over that of Bobby Seale. Uh, on the left is the original picture uh, from the, the 1967. Bobby Seale is there uh, on the far left, and then the, you can see the image of Khalid, Khalid Muhammad that was superimposed over him. The reason that the members of the New Black Panther Party did this is because Huey P. Newton is dead, uh, and so he is not able to critique or to reject the claims of the New Black Panther Party. But Bobby Seale is very much alive, uh, and he was constantly on TV in 2002 when this uh, uh, letter came out saying, the New Black Panther Party has nothing to do with us. They're a bunch of nut, nut jobs. We don't like them. Um, we don't want anything to do with them. And so they doctored this picture, threw it up on their website to sort of uh, uh, say that they really don't care what Bobby Seale thinks. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, to sort of read him out of the party's history as they saw it. Now, here's where things got interesting. This is a picture of the panel discussion. A few minutes into the discussion, approximately 30 members of the New Black Panther Party entered the meeting room. They were wearing bandanas, black military uniforms, some had their faces covered, others had on steel-toed boots, and uh, uh, actually riot helmets and motorcycle helmets. Um, and they walked in and sort of surrounded the back wall and then filled one whole side of the meeting room. Uh, and you can, you can not, it's hard to see, but you can see a lot of people still have their faces covered, have uh, sunglasses on, um, and they really appeared to be threatening the older Panthers in the room. Um, a really odd situation, particularly because most of the older Panthers in the room were in their 60s and 70s, and here you have a group of people in their 20s threatening uh, these folks who are in their 60s uh, and 70s. <clears throat> and at the head of the pack was uh, N New Black Panther Party Chairman Malik Zulu Shabazz. He led the group and he got up to speak. This is not him that's speaking in the middle. Uh, this is one of his deputies, but Malik Zulu Shabazz did most of the speaking. And he lambasted the old members of the Black Panther Party um, for saying that the new Black Panther Party did not exist and dared them to repeat the claim now that they were in the room. Um, Shabazz went on to declare that the former Panthers had no monopoly on the Black Panther Party name and that his group would continue to use it as long as they wished. This was sort of a throwing down the gauntlet. Um, and tensions really began to rise. I mean, it was a very, very tense situation. You thought that maybe some of these older members of the Black Panther Party, who were not soft guys. I mean, they, you know, they, a lot of them were, were from gangs. They had been uh, in fights with the police and with the FBI in their youth. Uh, they were not about to uh, get um, uh, pushed around by these young people as far as they were concerned. Uh, and so I thought maybe a fight might break out. And the reason I thought that is because if you look at the uh, man in the foreground with his head turned, you can see my neck. Uh, that's me sitting in uh, the front of the picture. Um, I don't know who took the picture. They just happened to, uh, I happened to be able to get it a couple of uh, weeks back. Um, <clears throat> and just as the tension got really thick, um, Malik Zulu Shabazz changed his tone completely. And he said, look, whatever disagreements we may have, um, I respect the Black Panther Party, and I hope to serve as the chair of the new Black Panther Party as a li living legacy of the Black Panther Party. More importantly, I know you guys are mad, so we're going to take the picture down. And in fact, it was taken down just a few days later. Um, and the older Black Panthers, I mean, this is just sort of a fig leaf. I mean, they had still pretty much insulted them at their own meeting. Um, the older Black Panthers, though, realized, look, these guys have more people than us. They're younger than us, stronger than us. They've got God knows what in their military uniforms. Let's take the deal. 
Uh, and so in fact they did. They said, oh, we accept your apology. Great, we're all in good shape. Uh, the new Black Panther Party, uh, their job uh, completed, headed out into the plaza on the college's campus and paraded in military formation and waved the new Black Panther Party's flag. Now, this conflict between the former Panthers and the new Black Panther Party is just one, this one that I recount, is just one in a long-running struggle between the two groups for control of the Panther name and imagery. Uh, this stretched across the 1990s and into the new millennium, and in fact, into all of our lives. It raises a simple question with a very complicated answer. What is the connection between the Black Panther Party and the new Black Panther Party, if there is any at all? Uh, former members of the Black Panther Party claim there's none. The new Black Panther Party claims they are carrying on the legacy of the true Black, of, of the, uh, Black Panther Party. And the reality is actually very complicated, and I'm going to try to explain it today. The reason I'm going to try and explain it today is because that reality tells us a great deal about the changing nature of black nationalist politics in the post-civil rights period, and I mean the period after 1965. It also shows us how political actors use history, or in this case I should say they manipulate history, in order to gain legitimacy. Um, so let me ask you all a few questions. Um, let me see your hands, if I could. How many of you have heard about the Black Panther Party, the original Black Panther Party? Okay, outside of your classes recently. So keep your hands up if you heard about it before uh, it was introduced to you in class just recently. Okay, so, so maybe a third of those who had their hands up a second ago. Um, how many of you know a good deal about the group? You actually know what they stood for. So the main uh, aspects of their um, platform. Raise your hands if you could, a little bit higher. Okay, sir, tell me, tell me one thing that you know about them that they stand for. Uh, right here. They're fighting for black rights. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's a nice big answer, so it gets everything, right? Good job. Pull it, pull it, relax. Pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it. Yes, sir. Uh, they attempted to uh, unify the black community. Like, they attempted to unify the black community. Absolutely. So they attempted to unify the black community. They're fighting for black rights. Yes, sir. It's sort of like, uh, by any means necessary, so, like, when Martin Luther King was just saying by, like, Yes, they were inspired by Malcolm X, uh, and in fact, they were willing to use self-defense, right? So they figure if we're attacked, we will in fact fight back. We're not going to use offensive violence, but they are going to use self-defense, right? Uh, one more person, please. We, from, yes, thank you. They wanted to protect themselves against police uh, discrimination and brutality. Yes, one of the main ways that they came to national attention uh, was by patrolling the police. Uh, the police in East Oakland were remarkably brutal when it came to African Americans. Uh, and so the Panthers would actually follow them around. Uh, and when they pulled someone over or when they arrested someone, they'd stand a couple feet away and they'd yell that person's rights to them. They'd say, the police can't move you unless they arrest you, and other things along those lines. And of course, they'd be wearing 45 magnums on their hip as they were doing this, so it was a very odd type of thing for the police to go through. Um, what relationship does the Black Panther Party, uh, in your minds, have to the new Black Panther Party? Uh, do you know what the connection is? The guys that you see uh, outside of that polling place in 2008 in Philadelphia, um, uh, the folks who were, or who were organizing sometimes in downtown Baltimore, sometimes in downtown DC, uh, what's the connection between uh, the group that I've uh, talked about from the 60s and the group uh, that we're going to talk about today? Anyone? Hey, you got the hand? Go. Well, no, I'm sorry, the gentleman over here, so go ahead. I like it. Uh, and so you're saying that the, the new group um, is far more focused on race than the original group. Uh, and that they could even be racist or black supremacist, right? Uh, whereas the old group was, in fact, more interested in something else that we'll talk about in a second. I like it. Well done. Um, so let's get into the particulars here. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by just saying that um, the original Black Panther Party, the group that, uh, that from the 60s, was not the first group to use this name. In fact, they borrowed it from someone else. And this is something that members of the Black Panther Party, the new Black Panther Party, will always point out when they say we're allowed to use a name because the folks that we stole the name from stole it from someone else, right? Um, the original Black Panther Party, 
Thank you. Uh, the original Black Panther Party was the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, and it was a civil rights group. Uh, this is a picture from the November 8th election of 1966 in Lowndes County, Alabama. Lowndes County was an approximately 80% black county in the Black Belt of Alabama. Uh, the Black Belt, which is now today called the Blue Belt, because it's the only part of Alabama that still votes reliably Democratic because there's so many black people there. Um, I, but, got I got a happy by the Oh, sure. Um, uh, so, uh, Lowndes County, Alabama is 80% black county in 1966. How many black voters do you think there were in, in, in let's say, a year before in Lowndes County, Alabama, 1965? How many black voters in this 80% black county? Give me a percentage or a number. Zero. Correct. Right? Not a single one. Right? Since Reconstruction, the century before. Uh, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating, Coordinating Committee went into this county and they said, we're going to crack one of the toughest nuts in Alabama. We're going to get all the black folks in Lowndes County, Alabama to register to vote. And most black people who were gaining the vote in the mid-1960s voted for the Democratic Party because Lyndon Johnson was the president. He backed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He backed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and so, of course, you go into the Democratic Party. The problem was that the Democratic Party in Alabama at the time was a party of white supremacy. In fact, it had a motto, and it, was not a, and it had a symbol, and it was not a donkey. Uh, it was, in fact, a white rooster, and under that rooster was a banner that said, for white supremacy and the right. Uh, and so black voters had a decision in 1965 and 1966 in Lowndes County, Alabama. They said, should we join a party whose motto is for white supremacy? And they thought, that's probably not a good idea. So they founded an independent political party called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. And in Alabama, uh, at the time, there was a law that you had to have a symbol for your party. You had to have an animal of some sort for your party. Uh, that, that, so that was for illiterate voters, um, so that they could choose your party even if they couldn't read the party's name. Um, and so uh, the SNCC activists who were in Lowndes County, Alabama at the time said, look, we need a symbol. And someone suggested a dove, and they thought, that's, that's weak. Uh, and so, a lot of the students who were in Lowndes County, Alabama organizing said, I've got an idea. Let's use the mascot for Morris Brown College in Atlanta, which was a snarling black panther. And you can see it right there uh, in the right-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner. And they very quickly became called the Black Panther Party. And this party lost all the elections in 1966. Uh, uh, voter fraud by the white Democratic uh, Party in uh, Alabama. 20% of the population, in, pardon me, in Lowndes County, Alabama, was rampant. Uh, and so even though black folks uh, outnumbered them by wide margins, they lost every single race they were in. But they became positively famous uh, as news media from around the country came down to Alabama uh, and checked out what they were doing. Thought it was remarkable, and in certain cases, kind of scary. Um, Groups from around the country began to imitate the Black Panther Party model. They actually went to the SNCC activists uh, during this period uh, who had organized the period and they said, look, can we please borrow the name? We love it. And Stokely Carmichael, who had been one of the main organizers, said, of course you can borrow the name. We don't have a patent on it. Um, and now the Black Panther Party does in fact have a patent on the name, just so everybody knows. Um, don't try to start your own chapter here, you might get sued. Um, <laughs> But a group from Oakland, California was one of the dozens of groups around the country who picks up the name. Um, and the founders of that group in 1966 were Huey Newton, who is second from uh, the left, the light-skinned gentleman with the small afro, and the man far to the right is Bobby Seale. They were the two founders of the Black Panther Party, and they, of course, brought the other gentleman uh, in the picture along. Um, and very quickly, in 1967, they came to capture the country's imagination. Um, and the other Black Panther parties around the country simply couldn't compete in the media. When you ask someone about the Black Panther Party, all the other groups from Detroit, from Philadelphia, from Southern California, um, nobody mentioned them. They mentioned the Oakland Panthers. And so very quickly, most of those other groups joined the Oakland Panthers. And some of them were, in fact, coerced into joining the Oakland Panthers. But either way, all these Black Panther groups very quickly became the single Black Panther Party that had its headquarters in Oakland, California. Now, one of the main reasons that they were able to capture so much media attention is because of three things that were at the core of their program. The first was self-defense. This is from a protest in 1967 where they actually went to the state capitol in Sacramento armed. 
Uh, I'm not sure if the guns were loaded, but they were absolutely armed. And they were protesting a bill that had been put forward by a member of the um, uh, California legislature. California at the time had an open carry law. You could just walk around with a gun on your hip if you wanted to. Um, and as soon as members of the Black Panther Party started doing it, uh, legislators thought it was a bad idea. And so they tried and pass a bill saying that you could no longer uh, uh, walk around with a gun on your hip. Panthers went to Sacramento to lobby the legislature uh, to get them to keep the law. Uh, and this, of course, uh, w was a really remarkable sight for many people uh, around the country when they saw these pictures. So the first issue that brought them to national attention was self-defense. The other thing that they became known for, though, and perhaps less well known for, was their adherence of Marxism. Uh, and specifically their advocacy of revolution. Uh, this is a group of Panthers who were all reading uh, Chairman Mao Zedong's Little Red Book. Um, they were very much uh, well-versed Marxists, and they believed that they could be the vanguard of a revolution in the United States. One of the reasons, by the way, that the FBI found them so threatening. <clears throat> and then the third thing that they became known for was their community service programs. This is a Black Panther Party community service program from, our, I believe, 1968 uh, or 69. Um, and you can see that they're giving away uh, free food uh, to members of the East Oakland community. Uh, the Black Panther Party, by the way, was headquartered in Oakland, but it had chapters around uh, the United States. In fact, for those of you who have been following the news, you know that Baltimore had a Black Panther Party chapter, and one of its members, uh, Marshall Eddie Conway, uh, just was released from jail uh, after 40 years uh, the other day. Uh, he had been accused of uh, murdering uh, a police officer uh, and uh, the judges found that there were uh, some errors in his trial and that he was released uh, from Jessup Correctional Facility um, just a couple of uh, days ago. Um, so there were chapters in, in most large cities with large black populations around the country. Now, there's one other huge reason that the Black Panther Party became so positively famous during this period, and I think that many of your professors can probably relate to this if they lived through the time, and that is that the Panthers were really, really cool. Um, I mean, they, and I think, I think a lot of you can really speak to this. This is a propaganda picture from 1967 of Huey Newton sitting in a, a famous wicker chair holding a spear and a, and a rifle. Um, and the idea that Black folks can be assertive, that they can hold guns just like the police, that they can hold guns just like regular white citizens, um, and actually stand up to the man, um, was really a, not a common idea at the time. Um, and then, of course, the leather jackets are just cool. They're just hip. Um, the berets, they're not hip now, but they were then, right? Um, and I mean really cool. This is a picture of Kathleen Cleaver. Uh, one of the more famous members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, Bobby Seal is to her right. Um, just cool. Um, and so large numbers of people uh, were attracted to the Panthers simply because um, of, I think, the, the, the feeling that they exuded. Now, in the late 1970s, the party went into very steep decline uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, because the federal government was out to get them and constantly raided their offices. Because of serious mistakes on their part, uh, whether it be uh, engaging in crim criminal enterprises in some chapters uh, or uh, uh, sort of doctrinal disputes between different members of the party who disagreed with each other. But either way, by the late 1970s, the party was a shell of its former self. It did not help that Huey Newton uh, got hooked on drugs in the late 1970s and very quickly spiraled down uh, into a very uh, bad state in the, in the 1980s. Um, and so it's during the 1980s, and here I'm dealing with the issue of memory, during the 1980s, the party was really little discussed by either former members or, quite frankly, by historians. Um, many former Panthers were repelled by the violence, drug addiction, and criminality of Huey Newton's later years. For others, the wounds of just concluded battles were too fresh and federal investigators still too active. In fact, if it wasn't someone like Marshall Eddie Conway who was in jail, those people who had been able to stay out of jail might be underground, actually on the run. Uh, something that's very hard to do with cell phones and stuff these days, but uh, back then you could, act, in fact, disappear uh, and stay disappeared for a pretty significant period of time, as long as you uh, refrain from using a credit card or something of the sort. Um, now I want to talk about the period where uh, Panther-like groups came back. Um, and the reason that a lot of Panther-like groups came back in the late 80s and early 90s, w which I actually remember from my living memory, is because of what happened in the, the 80s and early 90s. Um, in the 1980s and early 90s, 
um, you had two things that really blanketed many inner cities around the country and therefore perhaps a majority of the African American population. Uh, the first was you had an urban crisis. Um, many of you cannot remember this. I'll actually be speaking about a city that is not within your living memory, but I can remember when certain parts of Baltimore uh, were so dangerous that my mother positively forbade me to go anywhere near them. At the height of the crack crisis in the late 1980s, there were neighborhoods that the police didn't really want to go into. Um, you add to that massive joblessness because of all the layoffs down at the port, at Bethlehem Steel, at GM. Uh, in fact, many of you probably don't even know that uh, cars used to be manufactured here in Baltimore. And that's because all of these factory jobs that has, has, had sustained thousands upon thousands uh, of uh, Baltimore workers for generations were closing up. Uh, and when they closed up, you had huge swaths of the city where people simply didn't have access to a good job uh, or to uh, real wages. Many of them turned to the drug trade, uh, either as dealers or users. Um, and so you had an urban crisis in many American cities. And it didn't appear that black elected officials, liberal uh, black activists, were able to do much about it. Um, one of the reasons they weren't able to do much about it, but the other crisis that was facing the African American community during this time was a conservative ascendance. Um, during the 1980s and all the way into the mid 1990s, uh, conservative elected officials um, built a really powerful political coalition, which at its core um, was hostile to many of the policy reforms that African Americans favored. Uh, and they were able to take over the presidency with Ronald Reagan in 1980 and hold it until 1992. Uh, and then the House of Representatives in 1994 under Newt Gingrich. And of course, they were able to, they had the Senate for a couple years uh, uh, during that period uh, as well. <clears throat> and therefore, government institutions appeared to be hostile to, to doing anything serious about the urban crisis that many African Americans were suffering through. Uh, and so large numbers of African Americans began to look elsewhere for uh, a, a road out of this new crisis moment that they had faced. Uh, and many of them tried to find it in black nationalism. Um, I can remember during this period that black nationalist imagery, black nationalist organizing uh, was everywhere. Uh, this was a time when people were actually celebrating Kwanzaa. Um, and not just, not just seeing the Kwanzaa cards in the store and asking, what in the world is that? Um, this was a time when uh, large numbers of people uh, were listening to black nationalist hip hop as opposed to just party music. Um, this was a large time, this was a time when uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam was filling arenas. Uh, you could actually go down to the Baltimore arena and it would be packed, actually packed to see Louis Farrakhan. And this would happen in cities around the country, and that was because African Americans were searching for a way out and simply couldn't find it in what they saw as mainstream political channels. Now, part of the nationalist resurgence of this period also led to a renewed interest in the Black Panther Party, and this is where we get back to uh, the story that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, <clears throat> the Black Panther Party sort of cropped up in a lot of African Americans' memories as this time when black folks were really assertive and they were trying to figure out how to deal with the problems of the inner city. And one of the main reasons this occurred was because large numbers, uh, large numbers of members of the Black Panther Party came out with memoirs in the early 1990s. Perhaps the most famous is by Elaine Brown, former chairman of the party, who came out with her book, A Taste of Power, in 1992. Um, it also helped that during that same year, uh, the first member of the Black Panther Party to get elected to Congress uh, was sent to Washington, D.C. in the form of Bobby Rush uh, from Chicago, who is, in fact, still there uh, today. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, uh, in the mid-1990s, a number of plays and movies came out about the party. And so uh, Roger Guinevere Smith came out with a Huey P. Newton story um, in the mid-1990s, which was later turned into a movie by Spike Lee. Uh, so I think the movie is not that good, but the play is, that, in fact, quite good, and you can watch it on YouTube, as far as I understand. Um, and then last, um, Hollywood got in on the game in 1995 with the positively horrible <laughs> movie Panther, uh, which actually cast Kadeem Hardison uh, as Bobby Seale, one of the worst casting ideas in Hollywood history. Um, does anyone even know who Kadeem Hardison is? Shoot, I'm showing my age. Okay. Um, he, he's not a tough character, let's put it that way. Um, and so to, to okay. Um, 
And there were actually uh, several other movies in the works. Two other studios were going to do Panther movies uh, to try and capitalize on this interest in the party in 1996-97. But this movie flopped so badly that they were automatically canceled. Uh, and so if you really want to lose two hours of your life, go check it out. It's, um, it's horrible. Um, now, in the midst of this renewed interest in the party, uh, the members of the Black Panther Party, who had done such an amazing job of projecting a powerful image of themselves, controlling their image in the media, um, decided to get together and, put to, and, and create an organization that would control their image in the 1990s. And so they created the Huey P. Newton Foundation, uh, specifically folks like um, uh, Earl Hilliard, Huey P. Newton's chief of staff, and uh, several others, or Frederica Newton, his widow. Um, and they hoped that they could sort of shape the legacy of the party as people were consuming it in the 1990s. Now, I see I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to speed this up. Um, as they're going around talking about the Black Panther Party in the mid-1990s, uh, members of the party um, begin to make predictions like the one up here. And Elaine Brown made a prediction in Los Angeles in 1995 on her book tour. And she said, look, black people are an oppressed community who largely live in third world conditions. That was true in the 60s, and it's still true today. And the Panthers were a natural outgrowth, natural outgrowth of that fact. There was nothing startling about the formation of the party. And this country is ripe for the rise of another organization like it. It turns out that she was actually a couple years late. Um, in 1989, the gentleman up on the left-hand corner, Michael McGee, who's actually a former member of the Black Panther Party and at the time was a city councilman in Milwaukee, had created a group called the Black Panther Militia. Uh, and he had created this group to basically bribe the city of Milwaukee, or, or to threaten the city of Milwaukee into giving resources to the black community. He said, look, I'm creating a militia. And what we're going to do is if the city does not appropriate a huge amount of funds to deal with the crisis in the black community within the next five years, we're going to start blowing up bridges and shooting people. Um, and he was very specific. He's like, this is not what the party used to do. The party was into self-defense. I'm into offensive violence. We're going to start hurting people if you all don't appropriate money. He's a little nutty. But nonetheless, he's the first person to sort of resurrect the Panther uh, at, in the late 1980s. He inspires the young man on the lower left, Aaron Michaels of Dallas, Texas. He was on Aaron Michaels' show doing fundraising. And Aaron, who's actually a, a much younger, said, wow, I want an organization like this for my generation. And so he creates a new Black Panther Party uh, in Dallas, Texas in 1990. Um, and then one other former Panther, a guy named Kwaku Duran, uh, who uh, is, is still very active as a uh, lawyer in Los Angeles, creates the new African-American vanguard movement in Los Angeles in 1994. And again, his purpose is to bring the Panther back uh, to politics uh, during this period. Now, all of these groups uh, make an effort to sort of form into one national Black Panther party. Um, and the person who stops them from doing that is this gentleman, Khalid Abdul Muhammad, uh, who many of you may know as being uh, the national speaker of the uh, Nation of Islam uh, from the, mid the early 1990s. Um, Khalid Muhammad had become uh, the leader of the new Black Panther Party roughly around 1997, 1998. And when all of those different groups got together to say, hey, let's create a national Black Panther Party and make it just like the old one, he said, absolutely not. For one, as the gentleman pointed out earlier, I don't believe in all that Marxism stuff that those old Panthers used to talk about. I don't necessarily even believe in just self-defense. I think that offensive violence isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and by the way, it's my show. I don't want to be answering to anyone else. Uh, and so he said absolutely not to getting all the different groups together. What he was able to do, though, is make the new Black Panther Party into a national organization which was widely known within the media. Um, you'll see that, I, I don't know if any of you remember, but in 1997, a gentleman by the name of James Byrd was brutally murdered in, in Jasper, Texas. Uh, a, a bunch of um, sort of ne'er-do-well white supremacists went out and got drunk one night and they saw him on the side of the road, they decided to chain him to the back of their truck and drag him for a couple miles until his body fell apart. Uh, and it was a national news story. It was an absolutely horrible uh, situation. And the new Black Panther Party went down to his funeral, uh, claiming to protect the mourners against the Ku Klux Klan. And what they really ended up doing was making themselves uh, national news. Um, also, the next year, 1998, Khalid Muhammad led 
uh, what he called the Million Youth March. And I was, I was there. I lived in Harlem at the time because I was at NYU. Um, and it was more like a 100,000 youth march. Um, but nonetheless, it made him, uh, in his conflict with Rudy Giuliani, who was a mayor at the time, uh, a national media figure again. Um, it's at this point, because all the other New Panther organizations have sort of withered away, and the New Black Panther Party is the only one that remains in the late 1990s. Um, and it is nothing like the original Black Panther Party. Um, it's far more like the Nation of Islam. It has a very strict racialist theory. It does not believe in Marxism. Um, and it really focuses on getting its name in the papers through, through very um, uh, outlandish political uh, developments, like this one. In 2001, in October of 2001, so think 9-11's in September, uh, in October of 2001, the New Black Panther Party has a press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., uh, where Malik Zulu Shabazz, at this point, Khalid Mohammed had passed away from cancer. Uh, his understudy, Malik Zulu Shabazz, uh, basically says that we don't stand with the U.S. government's war on terrorism policies. Um, and it really caused some serious problems, interestingly enough, for the original Panthers. Many of the original Panthers had books to sell, they were speaking on college campuses, and people like Bobby Seale would you know, make a good amount of money every time he went to go speak to a college group. Um, after this aired on C-SPAN, all of his uh, bookings for the rest of the year were canceled. And so these new guys, who he has nothing to do with, are at that point taking money out of his pocket. And that's not just Bobby Seale, but it's many of the older Panthers uh, around the country who also are uh, facing similar problems. Um, and then in 2008, the New Black Panther Party sort of comes back into the fold um, as a national news story, and that's because of this. I'm sure many of you actually remember this from the nightly news. And in 2008, uh, two members of the New Black Panther Party outside of Philadelphia, um, or in a suburb of Philadelphia, um, go to the pollings, go to one of the polling stations in an almost 95% black neighborhood. And they say, we're going to protect black voters from whites who aren't going to allow them to vote. Probably not going to happen in this neighborhood. Uh, and they stood outside the polling place with nightsticks, uh, and they were captured by a Republican poll watcher uh, who then demanded that they be prosecuted by the uh, um, Justice Department. Uh, the short gentleman who actually had the nightstick in his hand was, in fact, uh, banned from polling places uh, not too long afterward um, and for the next couple of elections. Um, let me finish really quickly here. Um, this latest episode in 2008 forced the Panthers to again, the older Panthers, to again say uh, to uh, the world as, as quickly as they could, look, these guys are not us. We are not them. They're two different organizations. And one of the reasons that they had to do that was because the new Black Panther Party would go on TV and there would be a symbol in the background like the one right next to Malik Zulu Shabazz's head, which says, Black Panther Party, Panther Power. Now, that would cause someone who didn't know much about this history to think, oh, the Black Panther Party and the new Black Panther Party, or the, the group that this guy uh, represents, are in fact the same thing. Bobby Seale got on TV the next day on CNN to say the exact opposite. We are in fact nothing like these clowns. Please don't conflate the two. And so this dispute that really, quite frankly, is, is not of interest to many people outside of historians and folks on uh, the black radical left uh, all of a sudden became national news uh, for a period in 2008 and 9. Um, let me end with this. What do we make of all this? What does this story tell you all? Um, I want to suggest two things. First, and I want to riff off the title of that letter from the Huey P. Newton Foundation. Um, there is no new, in italics, Black Panther Party. The groups that were founded in the early 1990s were, in their majority, created by former Panthers, or young men inspired by former Panthers. They directly reflected some, but by no means all, of the Panther ideology and approach to organizing. The only group among those to survive into the late 1990s, however, was the New Black Panther Party. And that group survived by adopting the organizing style and ideology, and even recruiting members from the Nation of Islam. Said differently, the New Black Panther Party was not a new Black Panther Party, but rather an offshoot of the Nation of Islam that bore little resemblance to its namesake beyond the Panther symbol and the Black Berets. Second, and far more generally, and I think this may be of application to any of you who want to become historians or political scientists, this study shows the dangers of carelessly using a name or a symbol to track a political organization across time. 
Political parties do not have souls. They are me mechanisms for seizing and retaining power. And so knowing this, we know better than to equate the segregationist Democratic Party of the 1950s to the Democratic Party led by Barack Obama today. We also know that liberal, the liberal elitist Republican Party of the 1950s is different than the radical right and populist Republican Party of today. So too we must apply this test to the Black Panther Party. Not to do so would be to ignore 50 years of history, something that I know your professors simply would not allow you all to do. Thank you. Questions. Short questions, short answers. Maybe we get four. Okay. Yes. My name is the German Dom, your freshman. Do you believe that uh, Tupac brought any um, uh, uh, popular, like made this the Black Panther Party more popular than one before? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so, so, you know, Tupac began rapping uh, right in the middle of the black nationalist resurgence. Uh, I mean, became, became famous right in the middle of the black nationalist resurgence of the late 80s and early 90s. So he was influenced coming up uh, by black nationalist rap. Um, and of course, he was influenced by uh, his aunt, who was a member of the Black Panther Party, Afeni Shakur. Um, and, you know, he brought the imagery of the party to black popular culture, I think, in a big way. Uh, had it not been for him, you know, there would have been a little bit less influence. Um, but, you know, a rap song only gives you so much, right? And so I think a lot of people just sort of took the symbolism, took the basic idea, but didn't really deal with the, the meat and the ideology of the party, the original party. Excellent question, though. Yes? Uh, my name is Dale Waters. I'm a senior. Do you think that uh, the militant aspect of the original black uh, has been overstated in popular entertainment and media? Mm, that's, wow, that's a great question. Um, certainly some historians have argued yes. They've argued that, you know, a lot of what the party was doing at certain points uh, in its existence, right? So the party is really existing as a national organization from 66 to 74. And they would argue that for the, perhaps a majority of that time, the party was really more reformist than it was revolutionary. I mean, by the late 1970s, the party was running candidates for city council in Oakland, right? Um, that's not overthrowing the government, that's joining the government. Um, so, so, yes. Louder, louder, I can't. Hmm. What did he say? Uh, do, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, do you think there's a need for either the new or the old Black Panther Party in today's society? The new, no, um, largely because of the content of its ideology. I, I mean, it doesn't have a constructive program for, it, it, it feeds off of the existence of the ghetto, right? I mean, it, it feeds off of the fact that large numbers of black folks are in pain and they want an answer, right? Uh, and they feel like these people will stand up for them, even though they're not going to do much constructive to actually change their situation. Um, the old parts of it, I, I mean, you, know, you have to keep in mind that, that all of these groups were young people, like, like high school and college age people, and they made tremendous mistakes, um, which they'll admit, or perhaps not all of them, but they'll admit, I mean, they'll admit that we fought too much with each other, uh, we romanticized violence and the gun, um, we almost invited the police to come attack us. Um, don't get me wrong, the police would have gone after them anyway. Um, but, you, you know, they, they made tremendous mistakes. And so, yeah, I mean, a criticism of American society uh, that locks up more people than any other country around the world, both in absolute numbers and per capita, yes, we need an organization that does that. The original Black Panthers used to do that. Um, one that glorifies the gun, Probably a bad idea today, considering that every major police department in the country has a SWAT team and we're in the middle of the war on terror. I'm sorry, I do have to stop to thank you, Dr. Musgrove. It was